Let me introduce our distinguished panelists, starting with Professor Amanda Frost. Professor Frost joined the UVA Law faculty last year and writes and teaches in the fields of immigration and citizenship law, federal courts and jurisdiction, and judicial ethics. She has been, testify she has been invited to testify on judicial ethics topics before both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. Her writing and commentary on this subject has been published in a wide array of both academic and popular sources. Professor Josh Blackman is the Centennial Chair of Constitutional Law at South Texas College of Law, Houston. He's an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, has authored three books, five dozen law review articles, and countless blog posts. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. So we have a very wide range of potential topics, and to start, we've selected a few um, to focus on. So each professor will have the opportunity to share their thoughts on each topic before moving to the next one. And as always, please be thinking of questions for the panel. To start, and we'll start with uh, Professor Blackman, um, the question is on Congress's ability to impose a code of conduct on the Supreme Court. All right, thank you, Connor, Professor Frost, for having me. Uh, really appreciate being part of the show. Well, Connor, than usual, but so happy to be here once again. Uh, so I want to do a thought experiment. So imagine you're old James Madison and you're writing Article 3 in a blank page, right? We are a blank constitution. Would you design the courts the way it was done 200 years ago? Would you give judges life tenure, knowing that people living into their 90s? Probably not. Would you give judges the power to time their retirement to ensure that they can pick which president replaces them? Probably not. Would you give the U.S. Supreme Court the power to make nationwide policy on any issue just with five lawyers saying yes or no? Um, probably not. But I think we all agree that if we're writing on a blank slate, we would not create the court system we have. Uh, but we're not writing on a blank slate, and we have over 200 years of history behind us, and we have a current political moment that is quite obvious, right? For the first time in, I don't know, 90 years or so, there's a solid 5, 4, 6, 3 conservative court, depending how you count them a given day. And I think any discussion of Supreme Court ethics has to account for what came before and we are right now. And also, the politicians who are advancing the code are probably those who disagree with the court's. Uh, Current round of decisions, so we can't lose sight of this fact. Now, let me let me actually answer Tom's question now. Um, the question was, can Congress impose a code of conduct? And that's actually I think, a twofold question, right? One, impose means okay, Congress will write the rules, judges, the court, and you are bound by it. Right? That's option A. Option B is Supreme Court, you guys write a code, you write it, and adopt something, and whatever you adopt, stick by it. Right? The legislation that imploded, uh, there was a bill by Senator the White House, it's a good bill, it's a popular bill, would generally say, court, you must adopt a policy in X days, and here's what you have to do. Right? Uh, before we get to the substance of what those points are, um, can the Congress issue a court order, a command to a coordinate branch of government that you must do something? Uh, maybe say the commandeering doctrine of con law. It's not a perfect fit. Uh, but there's not an exact precedent by telling the court they must do something. Now, there's no, you can't do something. You can't sit in a case where you're recused. You, you have to meet a certain times of the year and so on. Uh, but I'm skeptical they can impose a code. Now, the second option is a more powerful approach. Um, you know, adopt something, pretty please. Let's just say it's like, you know, a request, not a command. Um, I think the court, and I think Amanda would agree with the court, probably should adopt something. Uh, they put out this statement of ethics and principles a few months ago, uh, which I suppose is a good start. Um, and I think that sort of preview that something more is coming. Uh, there's been reports that they've been working on this for years, that they've been uh, exchanging comments on, on different drafts. So I hope that in the near future we will get a code. Uh, but I think it's far better if it comes from the court's own uh, own volition rather than some imposition from so thanks to Connor for organizing and to the Federal Society for the invitation. And thanks to Josh for traveling us all this way and for you all for being here. Um, and I think we actually will agree a on a lot throughout this conversation. We have some disagreements at the margins, but I might lean into the disagreements just to keep things interesting. Um, but I was going to say, we do, I think, have a lot of overlap and places of agreement. And I also want to use this as just an opportunity to sort of educate people who maybe shouldn't like, OK, what are the limits on Congress when it interacts with the Supreme Court? 
And especially since this is the Federal Society, I thought we should look at some text when we think about this. So Connor's question <laughs> is, yeah, and, and original understanding, both. That's what we can do. Um, so Connor's question was, could Congress impose a code of ethics on the Supreme Court? And then there was some commentary about, well, you know, what are the limits and, and does Congress ever make the court do things? So here's where I think that both the text and the history really suggest, yes, Congress has a great deal of authority over the Supreme Court. Now, I want to right away distinguish between authority to control the substance of its decisions, which I don't think it has, and there's lots of text and structure of our system that is designed to insulate the court from that kind of pressure, such as life tenure, such as daughter protection. But the institution itself has always been subject to oversight and regulation by the by the Congress. So um, here we've got, and sorry, we've got to be a little awkward here looking back, but we have the judicial power. This is the first uh, section of Article 3. is vested in one Supreme Court. The Supreme Court must exist. The lower federal courts, they don't necessarily have to exist. That's what's called the Madisonian Compromise. James Madison uh, sort of crafted that idea as, okay, we, we'll, we'll decide whether or not to have lower federal courts, give that to Congress. We must have a U.S. Supreme Court. But you'll notice that there's nothing else there that we need to know, like where and when the court meets, how many members are on the court, what is the quorum needed to issue a decision, what is the budget of the court, um, how many staff can they have, et cetera, on and on and on. All of this has always been regulated by Congress. Moreover, it would be hard, the Supreme Court is not self-executing. Um, and so there's no way for it to come together and start operating as an institution without congressional legislation. So, um, and, and by the way, this provision as well uh, goes on to say, this is also Article 3, uh, now in Section 2, Clause 2, it says the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. So explicitly, if we're looking for text, explicitly says Congress can regulate. Um, so here's the things that Congress has regularly regulated. Um, I've already listed quite a few of them. Um, the last point I'll make, though, is um, Josh had said, well, Congress can't impose anything on the court. In fact, Congress requires by statute that every justice take an oath of office in which they swear to do equal right to the poor and to the rich and faithfully and impartially at discharge and perform all duties of the office. And that's required, and every justice says that and has since 1789 in, in, in taking their seat. So I think that is additionally both evident from um, the original understanding as well as from the text that Congress has such authority. Josh's final point, it would be better for the court to come up with a code itself than for Congress to impose it. I 100% agree. Thank you. The, the next question is about the efficacy of the current oversight regime on the lower courts, um, which is something that Congress has been doing. And Professor Frost, I was wondering if we could start with you for this. Yeah, so the lower federal courts are treated quite differently from the Supreme Court, both in terms of this code of conduct, or rather vague set of principles by which governs them, and the Supreme Court says rightly, it doesn't apply to them, but that they will follow it, um, or use it for guidance, I think is the actual word. So there's this code of conduct that sort of says, you know, you shall behave, you, shall, you won't get engaged in extracurricular activities that seem at odds with your judicial function, you'll avoid political statements, things like that. That does not apply to the, to the Supreme Court, but to only to the lower court judges. And then there's a statute, the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act, that was put into place now several decades ago that governs the lower federal courts. And under that statute, anyone can file a complaint with a, a court and say one of the judges on the lower federal courts, district court or appellate court, has violated some ethical rule or norm um, or violated the law. And then the chief judge looks at it. Often, in this, um, some, some studies of how this works. Often it's immediately discarded as improper. So a classic example would be a prisoner loses his pro se case and files a complaint about the judge that ruled against him and says, I lost and that was unfair. And you know, that just immediately gets put aside because that is not a valid ethical complaint. But if there is a complaint about the judge's conduct that does hold water, then the chief judge assigns a group of judges to investigate. If they find that there is some problem, they can refer that to the judicial conference, which is the administrative body governing the federal courts, and they can take actions such as censuring, publicly, a public statement censuring the judge. Um, they can have the judge you know, acknowledge the error and apologize and promise to do better. They can refer to Congress for impeachment, which is obviously the most serious possibility. 
And there are also lesser penalties, such as withholding decision-making or opinions being referred to that judge for some period of time. Sometimes required training, if the problem is with how the judge is treating staff, and there has been a problem with some judges. Um, so how is the system working? Um, there was a study in detail by Justice Breyer about 15 years ago now. Um, it said it works in most cases, but some particularly high profile cases, it appears to be politicized and a lot of people are filing complaints and you have to sort of weed through those more actively than you would for your run of the mill case. But on the whole, it seems to be working pretty well and the lower federal courts are following. Um, so there is an entire um, apparatus to enforce the code of conduct. I mean, maybe you've never even heard of it. But every circuit court to enforce it, something called the Judicial Council, right? And that's a body made up from the district judges in the circuit and some of the circuit judges in the circuit. If ever a complaint is filed, let's say by a disgruntled uh, person complaining or by someone else, it goes to this apparatus. Okay? It's complicated, the chief judge looks at it, the council looks at it, but what, there's a unique aspect to the apparatus. If a complaint is filed against a district court judge, usually the circuit, which is the judicial council, too. What happens if a complaint is filed against a circuit judge? Right? This has happened in the Fifth Circuit, the DC Circuit. If it gets beyond the initial screening process of the chief judge, what will usually happen is the circuit judge will transfer the case to another circuit. Okay, why does this happen? Because the circuit court only has X members, right? 10 total of that rule. One circuit judge usually does not sit in judgment of the other circuit judges with regard to that decision. It happens all the time. Tom Griffith in the DC Circuit, happens to Judith Williams in the Fifth Circuit, happens to Bill Fry in the Eleventh Circuit, happens to Bill Andrews. Okay, so why is that an important principle? Generally, one court does not want to sit in judgment of another. So it's easy enough to say the Eleventh Circuit has this issue, send it to the Second Circuit, we'll handle it in New York, no big deal, right? That doesn't map on well to the US Supreme Court. And this is a point that I was on in the Discussion, but there's sort of a hierarchy in terms of this meta that I think does both dramatically and consequentially. I mentioned this at the very back of these rules of the Supreme Courts, wherever they are, whatever Congress creates, and then the, at the apex, we have the Supreme Court. Um, once we start talking about efficacy of review, we say who actually gets to review the cases. If the circuit judges themselves, as a matter of course, don't hear cases out of colleague, we presume this would work with the Supreme Court. I'll give one more example of how it's worked in the lower courts in the Federal Circuit, Judge Newman. Uh, maybe you've heard about this. Judge Newman is a icon in Madison Law. I don't know if anyone knows Madison Law. She's 95 years old, if memory serves. She was appointed to the Federal Circuit when the court was created in the 80s. She's been in court forever. And there's been allegations by some of her colleagues that she is running a foul of conduct here. She is uh, taking too long to issue her opinions, and now she's questioning the investigation, and so on. That's actually not what we're going to talk about. There's now a fight over who gets to decide. Where Judge Newman's decided that the argument courts, you can't change the game, basically, to transfer the case to another circuit. And the chief judge is refusing. And this is now spilling out the litigation in the courts. And maybe you've never heard of this, you don't care about it here. Right? I think this demonstrates that even the process the lower court has is tricky when one court tries to bring judgment on their own colleague. I want you to keep that in mind. Now, the question was actually efficacy. The Wall Street Journal has been doing a lot of work on and they found hundreds of cases, actually thousands of cases involving hundreds of judges who have attributed recusal. For example, you know, a judge's spouse owns some stock in Amazon, and they actually pulled cases on the order of something to do. And they found, there's a key number right here, over 1,700 uh, 1, court cases involving companies whose they their family owns stock. And of those, over almost 900 cases were reopened and reassigned. So, you may say, oh my gosh, Josh, a thousand cases is a lot. I don't know. In the grand scheme of things, these are probably all honest errors. I don't think there's any sort of malfeasance. And it took a team of investigative journalists to actually track down these recusal issues. So recusal is a lot, right? Finding recusal issues is difficult. I think judges, as a general matter, are acting in good faith. They're not trying to, you know, skirt the rules we have in the lower courts, except for the lower court trial. Uh, but I think for the most part, the process is quite efficacious. Well, if you don't mind, can we exchange a little bit on that? So uh, I think it is working pretty well for the lower courts, and so I think we agree on that. But that does suggest that where the problem lies is the Supreme Court, because the 
Supreme Court justices, and it's not just Justice Thomas, but I am going to focus on him because he is by far the most voted on there. I mean, when you look at the ProPublica story that said he took 26 private jet flights and eight helicopter rides and a, a number of yacht trips all off track and 38 destination vacations since he's been on the court. And, you know, that there's there's been now many lower court judges who said that is extraordinary and, and you know we would never do that and why is a Supreme Court justice doing this um, and maybe one of the reasons is because there wasn't a process by which people could raise and publicize these problems and it took investigative reporters who really had to dig and spend months on the story to find out information and and if we had the process that we have for the lower federal courts working for the Supreme Court we might have avoided that and as I said I don't think that in fact you know, Justice Thomas, while I think an outlier in terms of the amount, he's not alone. There was Justice Ginsburg took and reported a trip to Israel funded by somebody else. Um, I think Breyer had also taken some trips, there were some trips. And what's extraordinary about that is I'll just tell you a little story. This is not Washington as usual, if you think this is Washington as usual, because there's actually very strict limits on the executive branch and on the legislative branch and what they can accept. Anything over $250 in terms of a gift has to be vetted by a committee. Um, nothing like that applies to the U.S. Supreme Court. And when I was teaching in, in D.C., I would invite a staffer, like a, somebody on the Senate Judiciary Committee, to come and talk to my class. And it would take them a couple hours. At the end of it, I would say, let me buy you lunch in the law school cafeteria. Like, this is not, I'm no Harlem crow. And <laughs> they would say to a person, no, I can't. I will, buy, I will have lunch with you, but I have to pay for that, you know, $6 or something. Because I cannot have any questions of having any lunch with you. That is the standard to which all of the other branches, and even the lower federal courts are holding themselves, just not in line with the Supreme Court. And I think if we had a, more law in place for that, maybe we'd see better things. I'll go to Thomas, I think you have a question. Sure, so the, the next question, we, we talked a little bit about the efficacy of the current recusal process. Um, a lot of the recent news stories have cast doubt um, in the minds of the public of the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Um, and I was wondering if you would like to speak to the role of public legitimacy in the proper functioning of the Supreme Court and in the judicial system. Is this something that the judge, justice, justices and judges should be worried about, or is this uh, not an issue? This one we're going to disagree on. Uh, so this word legitimacy, right? I think everyone uses it to maybe mean legitimacy, right? Um, when I hear legitimacy, I think of the soundness of your opinion, right? Um, I think of, are they actually following the text, history, legal principles, precedent, cases, right? That to me is legitimacy. I think in much popular discourse, legitimacy takes on a different tone in terms of what kind of extracurricular stuff. Now, I'm not going to defend Justice Thomas' decision to take all those private jet flights. You know, I don't know that he should have, right? Um, what I do know is that the rules were amended in the last year or so. And the rules made it very clear in the last year or so that you had to disclose what's called hospitality. Now, uh, did Thomas have the best reading of the rule? He says he received advice from his colleagues, from counsel, and others. So if people in judiciary told him you don't have to disclose this, and he relied on that counsel, can we only say that he acted appropriately, legally violated? No. Uh, the rule is not really required. He would need to amend the disclosure. Right? Um, but I think you should just be clear. The reason why the story is coming out is not just because of the domestic journalism. There's been a very sustained effort to try to move past this. And this began the second Justice Kennedy said, no mas, and uh, the court should be um, I If you want to go back even further, I think you start with Garland, uh, the, the Garland situation, which used to be giving out a hearing. This has been brewing for a very long time. Uh, it's no surprise that all the various bills designed are coming from those who disagree with the court decisions, and you can't separate that. So let me just, just finish out with this question. Let's say that one of these pieces of legislation is actually in the and they adopt a mechanism by which private citizens can file recusal motions. And under these various statutes, you'd have lower court judges sitting in judgment of what Supreme Court recusal. That is, a lower court judge would have to say, yes, Justice X, you need to recuse this case. And if the justice recuses, 
is what would happen next. I submit that whatever legitimacy issues exist now in the return regime would be far worse if this regime was implemented. Every single case would have a preliminary round of litigation over who actually gets to sit, which of the nine members being knocked out. And just to use simple math in the current court, if you knock out Justice Jackson or Justice Sotomayor or Kagan, it ain't going to make a difference, right? The outcome of the case is not going to change. If you knock out Justice Alito, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Eric, that will actually make a difference to the outcome. So every single case, when I think about like a preseason and regular season, right? Every case with a preseason fight will be knocked out. And you have this extensive litigation. And oh, Justice Alito did a case here, and Justice Thomas did this case there from cases happening years ago. Now, you can imagine that would be good. It would be a healthy process to have. I don't think it would. I think it would actually make the court more like a political body. Basically, like a primary for, for an election, right? Who gets to actually be on the ballot? Um, I think all the nine members of the court at least agree that having low court judges adjudicate this would be problematic. Okay. One final point on ethical code. Uh, Buffy said in the press that ethical code is binding, and it binds judges. And I think that that's just not accurate. We've all taken correct responsibility, right? We do like not the body in here, but we'll take uh, the NCRA at some point, right? There's a, there's a code of ethics for lawyers. This is not a bright line rule of enforcement. There's gradations, there's judgment, there's discretion. So we put someone on the court because we trust their judgment. Maybe we don't trust these guys' judgment, that's fine, but we we have judges and judges unless they have discretion in judgment. So I don't think Justice Thomas was deliberately trying to cloud the rules. I don't think he was intentionally trying to mislead. Um, if you read you do. I think once the rules were changed and people brought to attention, he made disclosures, he made amendments, and maybe you're somewhat happy with them. Fine. But I think at bottom these judges are trying their level best to do the right. We've had Justice Breyer defend Thomas. We've had uh, Justice Kagan defend Thomas, right? The, the justices are defending each other, right? They're, they realize that this attack is not healthy for the court. And that's why I hope the court does put something out that's substantive in the next, I don't know, few months, maybe maybe sometime this year, that actually maybe puts down the temperature, although I'm not sure about that. So first, I just want to address the point you were making about Thomas. Um, so the Ethics and Government Act of 1978 says that you have to disclose you know, gifts, and financially report them unless they fall within this hospitality exemption, this personal hospitality exemption. And then it says very clearly what's included, which is food, lodging, and entertainment. So that's the text, nothing about travel. It's also clear if you look at like the spirit of the law, it's like, so if I am a justice and I get invited to a friend's house for a judge and I get invited to a friend's house for dinner, I'm not like reporting the glass of wine and the chicken dinner I got, right? So it never covered travel. Now, it is true that there was some confusion from the Judicial Conference, which was giving guidance to these judges and justices about whether it covered travel. They made a mistake, all right? But that doesn't mean he didn't have to follow the law. Like, the law applied regardless of the misadvice, which he's never acknowledged. And second, I might be more willing to forgive that error, except for he does not forgive errors that others uh, make. So, for example, in Bowles versus Russell, case from 2067, he authored an opinion in which he said that a prisoner who was told by a federal judge that he had 17 days to appeal, the prisoner filed the appeal on the 17th day, turns out he had only 14 days to appeal, the judge said you were lied, uh, this is Justice uh, Thomas and, and four others, said you relied on the federal judge's advice at the appeal. And he did said the same thing last year when pro se prisoners relied on the advice of their counsel. And he said, well, their counsel misadvised them and that's, they bear the consequences. So I'm less forgiving of Thomas than I would be if he didn't take that line with people who are less educated in the law than him. Um, I would also be more forgiving if he said, I was sloppy and I failed to report and I should have. But the final point is he shouldn't be accepting these trips. It's legal under the law to accept the trips. It's not legal not to report them. He shouldn't be accepting the trips. And so I think this is a self-inflicted wound regarding the court's legitimacy, at least as far as that's concerned. Um, the point about recusal, I think I'd like to talk about a little more, um, and I'll shut up and give you a chance to respond to that too, but the recusal point, I think, one, I, I agree the lower court shouldn't sit and decide the justice's recusal, um, individual justice's recusal um, decisions, but right now, each and every justice decides for him or herself whether to recuse with zero review. That seems like an obvious due process problem and easily solvable by having all nine review each justice's recusal. 
Um, and that's how a number of state Supreme Courts do it. It's not like this has never been tried. So we've got like Vermont, and I think actually you'd know better than me, Texas, a couple other Kansas. Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin. So there's a few other states that do that. And so, you know, that would just create such a better appearance, if nothing else, right? And appearance matters when we're talking about legitimacy. In fact, the recusal statute itself says recuse when you have all these specific conflicts of interest and recuse when there'd be an appearance that you'd be impartial, even without the reality, because we're trying to protect the court. So we create the appearance, if not the reality, of uh, more valid recusal decisions if all nine were used. Um, so that's something that I think the court could easily start doing. It would need Congress to do it, but Congress could also do it by legislation. And I'll say, going back to Thomas, I'm less disturbed by the, the trips, although I'm disturbed, than by the fact that he sat now in two cases involving the events of January 6th. The second in particular, which was about a year ago, Ward versus Thompson, he was the only dissenting vote in a question about whether the January 6th committee could subpoena records from the state of Arizona when it was on record that Ginny Thomas had been interviewed by the January, his wife, interviewed by the January 6th committee, had been uh, involved in trying to get a new slate of electors set up in Arizona, the very question they were reviewing. And he sat on that case and dissented. He, he would have said, don't subpoena those records. I find that even more problematic because it goes to the, the merits of what the court is deciding. And I, I think it's even more problematic than accepting all of those vacations. And then the last point, are people in Congress right now using this issue politically? Well, yes. <laughs> um, I will say a few years ago, when Trump was president, I was invited to testify on this question about nationwide injunctions. Mm -hmm. And all of these Republicans were, were furious. I have been consistent. And so that's the nice thing with union academics. We, we get the luxury of that. I, these Republicans were furious that nationwide injunctions were stopping President Trump's policy from going into effect. They were weirdly silent when Obama was president. And now that Biden is president, it doesn't bother them anymore. And guess what? The Democrats are like up in arms about nationwide injunctions. No one inviting me from the Democratic side. That's why I'm not an issue anymore. So yes, is it political for those folks? Yes, that's all I'm saying. Um, I don't think that means we stop the conversation at that at that moment. So, but, sorry, that's a lot. Was there a question? I don't know if you said that before. No, I don't have another. We're going to open it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, then, then, then I'll uh, then, then I'll then I'll, I'll just re respond briefly. Uh, we have actually gone to this point. I do want to address this. Uh, so, 2011, the Chief Justice issued a this annual report. Right? It, it's always New Year's Eve. Around 5 p.m. Actually, that's my New Year's Eve routine. So every year, every year around December 31st on 5 p.m., the chief issues a report. And in 2011, he issued a report that actually made a substantive statement. And can you get the Article 3 slide, please? All right, so, um, you know, the section one, yeah, that's it. So the, the chief justice uh, made an argument saying, well, you know, the lower courts, they're bound by the, they're stuck to this ethics code, but we're not the Supreme Court. And he says, the Constitution creates the Supreme Court, not Congress. And therefore, we're beyond the scope of regulation. He didn't say that in so many words, that was an important point. And recently, Justice Alito made a similar statement in the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if I mentioned that. Oh, 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 I've got a slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is why she's, she's in charge, right? So Alito made a similar statement in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago. So just, just, just a basic point, a mandatory. The courts are not self executing right? Surely said the Supreme Court should be vested with this jurisdiction, no margin, everything else. But a statute is made in the case of this, which is the Judiciary Act of 1789, which is right? The position that Robert Cole, the Chief Justice, does here is to John Jay by the act of Congress, by the statute. Um, so the, the idea that the court is beyond the scope of any regulation, I think, doesn't hold textual or historical weight. Yeah, because that's the text. I think that issue is, is there. Um, the difficulty, though, becomes, I think, when we talk about the separation of powers, which is always the sort of political prime concept. There's no separation of powers clause in the Constitution. Um, and for better or worse, in our court system, I thought the court is assumed is this co equal branch. Maybe it shouldn't be, but, but it's basically, in some regards, above Congress, above the court, so they can have the final word. Um, if we start allowing each member to sort of sit in judgment of their colleagues, we are potentially giving one justice the power to knock out another white supremacist judge. Um, it would become, I think, 
very ugly if, you know, one justice said, we think it's a qualifier as a college in the case. You know, by the way, he's writing a dissent in that case. And that won't just be used on the left, that can be used on the right. And I think it's prone to abuse in a way that I'm not sure that the NA is abusive with the students. Right? In other words, the marginal benefit of having maybe some more recusal, I think, would be vastly outweighed by the sort of internecine fighting that would result when perhaps we consider justice say, oh, you know what, Justice Kavanaugh, I don't want you on the case. Your vote should not be out with prohibition. The game theory, the, the game theory is just running the criteria that have to associate with. Uh, this is why on the circuit court, in almost every case, we transfer out. And this is why the issue of Judge Newman in the federal circuit is not transferred out. So I'll sort of begin where I ended. If we were writing on a blank slate, I would never create the court slate with Mr. Madison, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Newman, and Virginia. Sorry. Uh, they, they, they had some good ideas, but perhaps it wasn't the best idea. But I don't know that any proposals I've seen are actually dead because they have to be now. Um, having the court adopt one either through an imposition or through a volitional act is fine, but if it involves having either the lower court judges lead to disqualification or allow each justice to knock out another justice with life tenure, um, I, I just don't think I'm comfortable. So that and, and you're saying something that, that Chief Justice said recently, in, or the, actually all nine said in the, in the sign uh, statement of principles, ethics principles and practices that they submitted to the Senate in lieu of testifying. The Chief, the Chief Justice was invited to testify and declined, but then sent this ethics statement that was signed by all nine. And in that statement, and I should try to find the exact wording, but they said something like it would be allowing all nine of us to vote on the recusal of any one of us would be allowing the justices to like ramp, like to select who sits yeah. on the case. That's how he put it. I was sort of amazed by that because of course they couldn't just randomly select who sits on the case. They would take the recusal statute, which is quite a detailed statute, and we won't look at all, but it's got this sort of broad catch-all of if you if there's a problem in terms of you would appear impartial, you would appear to be partial, you have to step aside. But then there's all these very specific provisions like financial. Um, if you have a financial tie to the case, or you know the lawyer, or you spoke out on the issue, you have to recuse. Very specific text. And the justice seemed to be saying, Chief Justice Roberts, but the other eight who signed it, we don't trust ourselves to apply the law as written, neutrally and impartially, regardless of the result it would lead to, when determining whether an individual justice should be recused. We don't trust ourselves to do that. We think we do it politically for the outcome of the case. If that is true, what about the merits? Like, after they apply the recusal statute, they go on to the merits, right? And there's a law that will govern how the case should be decided. Um, and to suggest that they would be so outcome-oriented as to recuse a colleague that didn't merit it under the recusal statute is to request, is to suggest we should lose all faith in the Supreme Court's ability to apply the law on any issue. So I found that sort of remarkable. In terms of their relationships with each other, I agree it's a little bit sort of sensitive, right, for eight to weigh in on the recusal of the ninth, especially because the ninth has chosen not to step aside, right? That's why we, otherwise we wouldn't have the other eight weighing in. So a couple things. One is they don't seem to be troubled by taking shots at each other on the bench and in their writing. Um, if you look at the sense, they're very strongly worded. They, you know, I think Justice Scalia said he'd written the majority opinion in Obergefell and Heisman paper bag, and he's called his colleague, he's called his colleague crazy at times and things like that. They, they seem to survive that. Um, and so I sort of think they're not that sensitive. And also, they're deciding extraordinarily sensitive questions for the nation. And maybe they can be a little uncomfortable in their interpersonal relationships if for every so often in order to, to show the legitimacy and effectiveness of that institution. Any other questions? Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to open it up to questions if you sparked anything. I have a question. I was wondering what your thoughts would be on a independent commission created by Congress to govern the judicial ethics rulemaking process. Like a five-member board, like the CC? Well, kind of like with how states do it for uh, leadership. I, so, I mean, that, that, that presents the similar issue of having an apex court beneath some of these not. Uh, at least on the verge of having life tenure judges sit in judgment of things like that to insulate people process, uh, when you say independent, you're still appointed by politicians to make their draft terms of the pitch, the draft being, uh, being renewed, and there's various political pressures. But I think 
this service you can only work with judge systems and judge and judges. Um, uh, I don't need to have like, a five member board to take those decisions. That, that probably would be enough. Right? But are you are you saying to come up with the ethical rules or to like police the rules? Both. Yeah. So to you know maybe to advise on what would be the best ethical rule. That I don't know that that would be a problem. I think to police the rule, like to say you violated the rule, that's a problem. But maybe that question sort of lends itself to like what can be done here, right? And you know, it, it's not like this is unprecedented. We've got the lower courts who issue statements of censure, right, publicly censuring a judge, or who have the judge have to go through some sort of training if there's an HR problem in particular, or withhold opinions from a judge. There's also precedent on the Supreme Court for this. In 1974, uh, the justices all got together because Justice Douglas had had a stroke. He was clearly not cognitively entirely capable of deciding cases. And they agreed among themselves that if he was ever the decisive vote in a case, they would postpone the decision a year um, and put it off so that somebody who's cognitively impaired wouldn't decide the case. And he retired not long after that. So with that as our precedent, if we have a justice who's simply sitting on cases in which he has a latent conflict of interest, it would be well within, I think, the realm of what's been done before to say that if he's the decisive vote, that case should be punted for the following year or just not decided at all. And the justices could do it. Um, and, and I think Congress could also say we need a refusal stick process that works better than the one we have and, and put in place various mechanisms to do that. Other questions? Yes, sir. Well, I can take a first. Okay. Sure. See, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I think sort of a basic ADA question. So in this case where Justice Thomas had a conflict of interest, um, you're saying, like, in a normal case, um, isn't the judge obligated to recuse himself, but because it's the Supreme Court, I guess it's sort of like above like the APA regular rules, or can you speak to that? The about the like, rules of conduct that the Yeah, like the which ethical. Which American Bar Association, the VA, can hear the action. Yeah, isn't the ABA what governs like the ethical rules? And, um, Those are all model rules. They, they don't actually, they're not defining any rules. Oh, okay. Recusal is governed by federal the, the statute. statute. Yeah, it's not the ABA. It's a federal law passed by Congress that applies to justices, so it applies to them, regulating them. And then this is the provision that I specifically put up there because I thought Thomas sitting in the case about the Arizona electors was explicitly in violation of this clause. But it's a federal statute that they're violating. I mean, the harder question is, what do you do about it, right? What do you do about it, other than impeach him? Which, and I, I, you know, I've been critical, but I haven't thought to go that far. And I think that it would be better to have a mechanism that's less than impeachment. It would be best of all if the court would police itself. And so far it hasn't. By that I mean other justices getting together and, and telling Thomas this is unacceptable. And they've done almost the opposite. Is there a follow-up? Oh, yeah. But like, uh, in this particular case, to what degree is Clarence Thomas's wife subject to be on the chopping block? For lack of a the better chopping word? block? Yeah, like, no, 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 no. for, for what, to, like, to, to what extent, because yeah. if she just has her political opinion, yeah. you know, and she's yeah. been active in politics, yeah. you know, then it's sort of like, well, there might not be a conflict of interest because it just so happens to align with his views on this legal subject and uh, that sort of thing. But is she potentially facing liability in her own capacity? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, the extent of her activity was she sent some form emails to some of the individuals who were state electors, which is her copy pasted email. I mean, it, 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 I, I mean, January 6th is easy to and there's no actual uh, sanction of anything I'm aware of. No chopping block. So the January 6th commission interviewed her, and they did make criminal referrals at the end of that process. And so I agree that she was not, in the end, referred, but the idea that she didn't meet this language, or rather, it's, it's not her obligation. She can do whatever she wants. And it, it's his obligation to recuse in a case in which she's directly involved. Not because she's expressed a political opinion. That's not the point. It's because this was a case about a commission that was investigating what happened in Arizona, getting information, subpoenaing information from Arizona. And his wife, a justice's wife, had an interest in that matter, both because she was being interviewed and therefore investigated by this commission, and second, she'd been involved in that very issue about display of black Those were substantial. I mean, yeah. her involvement was pretty, pretty slight. She sent okay. some form emails, but they're substantial. Yeah, well, and, effect. 
the substantial is she was being interviewed by the body investigating to see what crimes had been committed with a potential referral for criminal prosecution to the Department of Justice. So that seems to me like the kind of conflict that needs to be refused. But to be clear, she can do what she wants. It's his problem. And second, I'll just say, since we talk about it all being political, I'm publicly on record as defending John Roberts' wife, who was weirdly the target of a New York Times article for working, basically. <laughs> and I was like, no, both of them have done their best to avoid problems, and I think the best should work. And they should have social app and friends, too. It's, so I just want to be on record saying it's not like I'm critical of just having a spouse kicked out in the world. It's a very specific. <laughs> so, I, I worry that the discussion of an ethical code is a bit misleading here, and I, I get very worried when we are talking about imposing a broad ethical code. And I'll give the example of White House's letter. So, everything Professor Paul Frost was talking about really, I think, touched on issues about disclosure under the uh, Financial Disclosure Act and what should be the consequences of that. And should we beef up the Disclosure Act and the recusal statute, which I tend to think we could, but that could be done without imposing a new ethical code. I think this is a little bit of a red herring. So White House, for instance, in his letter, chastises Justice Alito for supposedly talking about a future case in front of the court. And I mean, okay, maybe he was doing that. Of course, as I think we know, He's not talking about a specific case, so most of the judges do this without violating the judicial codes that are in force. And this just illustrates I'm very worried about some very detailed ethical code being imposed on the Supreme Court and, it, and the court just becoming a political football over and over and over. And I just don't think that is what we're worried about. I think it's the kind of things that Amanda was talking about. These improper influences that we think may be, in, you know, ha having an impact on the decision. Couldn't we address that by just beefing up the disclosure uh, requirements and the recusal statute? I guess the, the, so I would like for you to say, how much of this can we just, can we deal with these core problems by just revising the statutes or on the book that nobody, in my knowledge, has ever seriously doubted the Constitution well, except for... Well, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about until this, right? Until this. Okay. And we don't know what he's... He could have been talking about a general ethical code, but he didn't know that, right? Uh, so I guess I, I think we we should be focusing on those issues, and I'd like to hear you guys say more about what... And I think the solution is bright line rules and not discretion for the, you know, eight justices to vote on the other. I think we just need more bright line rules. And then the other question I wanted to ask you to is remedy. And this is this I think is the hardest question. What if the disclosure act imposed a remedy of if it, you know if the disclosures turn out to have been false, something like it declares the, the any decisions made void or the acts of the justices void or something like even the justices have said from the West Virginia case. There was a violation, I think it was a due process, they based it on due process, right? And the decision was void. Could we do something like that using the Financial Disclosures Act? And so we impose a remedy that's going to really put some teeth on it. Oh boy. Um, so uh, I want to answer your question. I'll let you go to the first. So you all, you all studied the four packing plan in the deal, right? The Senate actually invited Chief Justice Smith to testify in the case. Uh, he was actually wanted to, but Bremer said, don't you dare. You'll be going to politics and going to get this. And he said, no, no, He said, fine. I will send a letter to the Senate, and I'll have it signed by the justices, and we put Roberts in there saying that he was it. Now, the letter that he wrote didn't just say this is a bad idea, it actually suggested this policy is unconstitutional. Because under the Roper proposal, you heard division. You'd have cases by three or four justices at a time. And there's actually a sentence letter saying that this is inconsistent with the one article court. So what Roberts is saying here actually has some legs. Now, the reason why I mention this is this was actually sent in a letter to the Senate. He actually didn't get all nine justices. So he said, I have two, two, two signatures, Brandeis and Van Zandt. He said, I'm confident the others would agree with me. 
that he did. Apparently, Stone and Cardozo didn't agree with each other. Okay, why do I mention this, right? Uh, because Justin sometimes would talk sort of out of the box. You know, instead of what Michael up or Alito had said. And, you know, I, I think the professor's question is what's the remedy? Like, what's the chopping block? To use my friend's uh, words a few moments ago. Of course, impeachment from the table, that's never been, you know, no Supreme Court justice has been removed from office for Samuel Chase impeached, didn't go anywhere. Uh, you get a couple Confederate judges impeached, but they're, they're going to go beyond that, right? Um, could you retroactively nullify a decision, let's say years later, you found that their uh, disclosure was improper? Uh, the people in the de facto office of office, I think it's a good thing, right? Which basically says if you have a person in office and later found that they perhaps didn't hold the commission properly, you don't nullify their actions. Because there's significant consequences. If you lose a court case, you might get years in jail, so you don't get that time back, right? If there's a, uh, a court case that a business transaction of billions of dollars, you don't come so I think, I think nullifying the decision is, is not the how how even under the paper system is not intended to be employed, right? Um, now the first part, can we beef up the disclosure rules? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to think what would the disclosure rule have been for Thomas as opposed to like Jimmy Thomas sent my email to these people in Arizona. You know, I'm trying to think how could you actually disclose that, or it could just be that disclosure so onerous that your wife can't be involved in politics. Stephen Weinmark, for example, the Ninth Circuit uh, Lion, his wife was the president of the ACLU of uh, Southern California, the director, and she did lots of stuff. So, I mean, maybe the answer is the spouses of Supreme Court justices due to these disclosures can't do anything remotely politics. Like Jane Roberts feels like a recruiting for law firms, which is, you know, pretty boring stuff. It, maybe that's the answer. And I think that would be more palatable than, than disclosure of Congress, because that's really. Yeah, so the point about Actually, I think the moment of disclosure is the moment when the justice is facing the question of whether they should recuse. And if they decide to sit on the case or the recuse, they should explain. They don't explain at all. They just say, usually they say nothing if they sit on the case, or they just, it's noted they recused. And that means they're inconsistent. Some justices seem to follow a more rigorous standard than others. I took your disclosure to mean disclosure of these trips and things. Maybe you meant more of the, the political co the conflict in terms of the uh, conflict of interest. More than disclosure, I think they should stop accepting gifts, period. They can retire and accept all the gifts they want, although those gifts wouldn't keep coming. Um, <laughs> no, Justice Harlan, uh, sorry, not Justice. Harlan Crow, the man who gave Thomas the gifts, when he was asked, would you be friends with Thomas if he weren't a Supreme Court justice? He was asked this in April 2023. Here's his answer, I'm gonna quote it. Quote, it's an interesting question. I don't know how to answer that. Maybe not, maybe yes, I don't know. If a friend, nobody was friends with me because I'm a law professor, but if, um, but if a friend said, I don't know if I'd be friends with her if she didn't have her current job, I'd be like, that's not a friend. <laughs> I don't think he'd be getting these free trips if he wasn't a justice. I don't think that's a shocking thing to say, and he should never accept them. And others too. I mean, he's the outlier in terms of accepting, but he's not alone. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, you had mentioned that some um, state Supreme Courts have similar recusal um, rules to what is being proposed that the judges would, or the justices would kind of monitor and vote for themselves. So going back to the idea of like game theory within yeah. that, has that been a problem in any of those yeah. state Supreme Courts? Well, what the state Supreme Court judges often have is the state Supreme Court justice can't hear a case unless you take the lower court judge to move up. So it's extremely game theoretical, actually, how that selection happens. Let me give you an example, Alabama. Her name is Roy Moore. He was the often chief justice of Alabama. He had a lot of run-ins in the Washington and his monument, that would be constitutional today, in the courthouse. And he had a federal court order against him. He refused to, uh, I'll see what they did. He had a run with the court and it wasn't successful. There was a motion made to basically move the Supreme Court. And then all eight other members of the court refused. And they actually had to pick a new temporary Supreme Court to hear a case and by fluke of nature. I was actually in Alabama that it went. So I told them to do this. They picked eight names out of a candy box. They, they, they basically had a, a, a candy box. They put all the names from the lower court judge in a the box. They, they drew you know, nine names out of that. So completely random, I chose this fashion. But those people who had never elected the state Supreme Court decided whether a state Supreme Court judge could review. And maybe long economic spans, that's a better approach. I, I don't know, but it, 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 it happened in the lower court. It, 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 so 
obviously some states have chosen to do this and have kept it in place. Um, so it seems to be working well enough for them. I would say what we have now is not working at the US Supreme Court. So would it work perfectly if all nine reviewed each other? No, I'm sure we've come into problems. But at this point, I think the problems are greater with the system we have. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, um, I wanted to touch on your point of legitimacy. And you said it was centered around the substantive portion of the justices' work. Are they accurately applying the history and text? But what role and what proportion do you think it comprises of legitimacy of like public perception of judges behavior? Because you know, at the end of the day, like it, it looks pretty damning. So, like, what? How large a role does that play? For you? I was just curious. Mm -hmm. Look, you're, you're right. I'm a law professor. I care about the merits, right? But the average man on the street is right? right? Most people see the headline in the newspaper. Supreme Court upholds gay marriage. Supreme Court strikes down Roe v. Wade. Right? They see the bottom line. So, I think for the public at large, um, those sort of peripheral issues actually do matter. You know, the stories that ProPublica uh, and then mentioned. You know, I can quibble with them, but they've had a very big impact. They, they got their money's worth in that, in that initial case. They, they put a lot of work into it, and they, get, they got return on that money. Um, my point is different is that the justices themselves, sorry, I'm going to calm down, should not concern themselves with that too much, right? The purpose of life tenure is to not care about that stuff. I think Congress can, and in the legal statute, they should address the issue up a little bit. But I think it becomes a very dangerous, dangerous hole when the justice starts going to behavior what public. Uh, if you go back to the case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist described the role of the bottom of the case. Once you start worrying about how your opinion is perceived by the public, you keep falling down the hell of the bottom of the case. So, yes, should, should people outside the court care about it? Yes. Should one of the court care about it? Yeah, I think this goes to the legitimacy question, of which there's you know, absolutely no right or wrong answer other than sort of thoughtful people trying to do their best. But I will say that the court to me has before, I think, committed this self-inflicted injury, which is to the degree the court is deciding, deciding incredibly sensitive issues that lead people to sort of look at them and think, who are these nine people? If they are not living their lives to the strictest ethical codes, then they are inviting criticism based on the fact that people not just disagree with their opinions, but think that the people deciding it are biased and corrupt. And I'd like to see that stop. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>